Yeah, Steve thinks that this mic might pick up a little bit better. So I, my voice is never carried, and I have a tendency to drop this mic away from my voice. So we're going to try to do better. Um, I love that thought, King Jesus. You know, he is truly king. He's truly Lord of Lords. All authority in heaven and earth is his. And today we celebrate our king. We celebrate our king. And in him we find life, we find hope, we find deliverance, and we find our peace. He is the Prince of Peace. And Lord knows that we need peace in this life. And that peace is the Lord Jesus Christ. So today, I'm going to do something just a little bit different. And uh, we're going to take a look at uh, a three days journey, is what I'm titling it. But before that, I, I want to talk about a little bit of history. And, and I, I love history, and I, I hope that you all like history too. But so I'm going to take a brief moment to really talk about uh, history and, and the celebration of the resurrection uh, today. But before we do, can, I, can we just pray again and just invite the presence of the Lord Jesus? Father, my heart's desire, more than anything, is to honor and glorify your son Jesus. And I, and I pray that through your word, that it would come alive to our hearts, not just our ears, but our hearts and our minds, and Lord, that we would enter into the, the presence of your Son. And that we would enter into his glory. And through our lives would be transformed into his, his image from glory to glory. And I pray that this would be accomplished by the power of your Spirit. And we glorify your Son Jesus today. Amen. So, this question that I have is... is most of Western Christianity is going to be celebrating the resurrection tomorrow. And, and this question is, I don't know if you've ever considered this, but, but, but why is that? And this year is particularly interesting because, I don't know if you, if you pay attention, but like, so the Jewish Passover this year is going to be on April 22nd. Now, that's interesting that that the resurrection would become before the Passover. Why, why is that, number one? Number two is, so I don't know if you know it, but like, I wanted to look this up and I didn't, but about 30%, 30 to 40% of Christianity falls within the Eastern Orthodox branch of Christianity. Russian Orthodox, Greek Orthodox. They won't celebrate the resurrection until May 5th. What? Why is this? Well, what's going on? You know, so, so I thought I thought it would be useful to have a history lesson because we we, we come across these questions and, and there's no I'm not coming at this from a point of judgment. I just want, want you to understand what's what the reasons are and what, what, why they do what they do. So first of all, I want to go back to the Jewish Passover because I, I think this is interesting to understand how they would calculate the, um, the date of of the Passover. Well, in Exodus, it talks about that the uh, Passover would be on the 14th of the month of Nisan. And, and the way that you would calculate the, the month of Nisan is it would be the first month in the spring in their, their, in their calendar. In Exodus chapter 12, I think it's verse 1 or 2, it says, this will be a, a new month for you uh, in your year. And so from that day forward, Nisan, this month, was the, the beginning of the Jewish calendar. Now, there's an interesting fact here, though, and it, it revolves around the Feast of First Fruits. And so, on the day following the weekly Sabbath, that's always a Sunday, they would, um, following the Passover, so whatever day the Passover fell on, go forward to the first weekly Sabbath, and the following Sunday was the Feast of First Fruits. And the priest, the high priest in the temple, would in the first thing in the morning, early in the morning, he would raise this um, bunch of, of barley, ripened barley, and would wave it as a as an offering to the Lord. 
Uh, you can read about that in Exodus 16. Um, so in, in Leviticus 23, there's a verse that says, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land that I give you and reap its harvest, you shall bring the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest, and he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord so that you may be accepted. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. Well, this precludes one thing, is that the, the barley is ripe. It's got to be ripe. So now, the Jewish calendar system is a, a lunar calendar, which is, which is a lunar cycle is 29 and a half days. And so that if you just follow a lunar calendar, 12 lunar months equals, you know, you're gonna come up short about nine days every year. So a solar, takes, a solar year takes 365 days, but 12 lunar months is roughly nine days shorter. So each day, if, if, if Passover is today, let's say, and it's, it's not, but let's say it is, next year it's gonna be nine days earlier. And next day, next year after that, it'll be nine or eight days earlier. Guess what? The, the barley's not gonna be ripe. So what do you do? So if the barley was not gonna be ripe that year, they would, they would just, on the spot, and it had to be, it was ripe in Jerusalem, right? So they would just say, there's gonna be an inner calendar month, an inner calendar lunar cycle. We're gonna have a 13th month this year, and we'll wait one month for the body to ripen. And so really, if you had a cold spring or whatever, it could throw you into, there, there's, it's not a precise science. You can't just calculate a day. So it's a little bit imprecise. Something devastated Judaism beginning in AD 70 when the temple was destroyed. But there was a, another event that was probably almost as much devastating. Because once, once the temple was destroyed, the foundations of Judaism just crumbled. So you don't have remnants of Sadducees anymore at all. The priesthood collapsed. The priesthood functioned around the temple. From that day forward, so what we have today is really the Pharisees. So rabbinic Judaism is what we have today. That, that's, that was the, the, the children of the Pharisees that, that comes. So what they did, but there was, a, there was another event. It was in AD 115, there was the revolt of Bar Kokhba, Simon Bar Kokhba. And uh, they considered him to be the Messiah. And uh, it was the second revolt against Rome. And again, it caused all Rome to bring in all the, the uh, legions. There's a huge revolt in Alexandria. They burnt almost Alexandria to the ground. There was a huge revolt in Crete. There was a revolt. Um, so again, Rome had to stomp out the rebellion. And from that point forward, Rome, I don't know if you knew this or not, but this is historically interesting, I hope, but they rounded up Jews and they made it illegal. You could not, a Jew upon death could not live in Judea. They could not live. They, and they sold them as slaves by the millions, by the millions. And history records that the price of a slave, when you could buy a slave with the change in your pocket. There were so many slaves being sold, Jews. That's how the dispersion, the, the, the great dispersion happened. That's why you have Jews all over Europe, all over the Roman, what was then the Roman Empire. They, they sold them everywhere, everywhere. Slaves, 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 slaves. No Jews in Israel. But there's no Jews in Israel, then how do you know when the Passover is? How do you know when the barley's ripe or when it's not ripe? Or how, how, do, how does a people that is dispersed hither and on everywhere gonna have a Passover? There was a man by the name Hillel, the younger, and he established what was considered to be a lunar solar calendar. And uh, basically he calculates a formula. And it, it's a, it's like, it's hundreds and hundreds, it's like almost a thousand years before the, the Gregorian count, over a thousand years before. It's a masterpiece in, in, in calculation. But that calculation became when the, the Jewish, and so they still count for a lunar month, 
And so Passover is always on the 14th day of a lunar cycle, but it's, but it's calculated not by the ripe, ripened barley any longer. That's interesting. Well, the, the Christian church really had a resistance, and there was a lot of uh, persecution of Jews, or at least animosity towards Jews among the Christians. Um, I won't go, go into a lot of the details, but Christians were just lumped together with Jews, and, and, and Rome hated Jews. And there was a lot of persecution against Christians because they saw them, Christians as just another part of Judaism, just, a, just another Jew. And so they, they, Rome especially wanted to break any association with Jewishness whatsoever. So Rome went to a, a lunar calendar to calculate the, uh, the date of, of the resurrection service, Easter. So it's the first Sunday after the first full moon after the vernal equinox. So when you have the spring equinox, it's the first full moon, and then it's that first the Sunday after that first full moon after the vernal equinox. So it falls tomorrow, um, according to Rome, uh, their calculation. Now, it's interesting because the Eastern Orthodox Church never agreed to that. Um, and they, they took the stance that, no, you cannot have the resurrection service before the Passover. Can't do it. So what they do is they tie, Eastern, North, Eastern Christianity ties it to a Sunday after, after um, the Passover. That's why he, this year will be in May 5th. So just did some history to help, I mean, I hope that, hope that kind of helps understand exactly some of the, the reasons why we celebrate the resurrection depending on where you are in Christianity on different dates. Well, we're going to be having our Lord's Supper service on April 22nd. So we're going to, um, April 21st, yeah, yeah. So let, let me explain that. <laughs> uh, sorry. So in the Jewish calendar, the day begins at sundown in the evening. And so Jesus was crucified on the Passover, April 4th, I mean, Nisan 14. But he takes the Lord's Supper service on the evening before. It was still the 14th. So it's still, but it's, it's in the evening. It's in the very start of the day, Nisan 14. And then he was crucified the next day. And so, it is, it's been our tradition to, to, to meet and to gather and to remember him, to remember his death. Um, we're going to do so. That will be Sunday night, April 21st. And, and we'll, we'll, we'll share our Lord's Supper, a communion service together, kind of a yearly service, at, um, special time. So I just invite you all to, to come on Sunday night, April 21st. So now let's get into the, the door. Sorry. <laughs> But I, uh, I want to take a look at a three days journey. And my, my thought on this is to, I want us to enter into the journey of walking with Jesus to the cross. Um, so in these next few weeks, I want us to, to enter into this, this journey with the Lord. And I want to go back into Luke chapter nine, the account of the transfiguration, you're probably at, this is the third week I've, uh, I've talked about that passage, and so, <laughs> but I, I, I felt like the Lord was still speaking to me about it, so let's go back there again. I want to read verses 28 to 31 again. Now it says this, about eight days after these sayings, he took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered. And his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah. And that brings us to verse 31. This is where I want to focus today. And it says that who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was to accomplish at Jerusalem. So it's interesting because Luke is the only of the Gospels that actually tells us what they were the subject that they were talking about. Why, why was Moses and Elijah there with Jesus on the mountain? And what were they discussing? What were they talking about? 
Well, Luke tells us they spoke of his departure that he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now, that word accomplish, there's two words that I want to take a quick look at. The first is accomplish. The Greek word is play um, it's, a, it's a fairly common word. It's used a lot in the Gospels, but it's almost always translated to fulfill. And so, for instance, if you're, you're acquainted with the scriptures that will say, uh, where Jesus, like on the road to Emmaus, this is, this is interesting because I think there, there's a corollary here. He's speaking to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, and he says, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law and the prophets and scripture must be fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. So, Everything written about me in the law and the prophets, Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. So there's this, as they're discussing on the, the mountaintop, there's, a, there's a, a talking about the fulfillment that must occur as, as the, he, he goes to Jerusalem, what must occur in Jerusalem. The second word that I want to take a look at is that word departure. Departure. Now, now Luke uses uh, language about departure a lot in, in his, his Gospels. There were three occurrences just earlier in Luke chapter 9 where he instructs, you know, in who, whatever house you enter, stay there and from there depart, right? And, in, and remember in Acts chapter 1 in, in verse 4, and while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but only wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. So my point is, Luke uses this type of language all the time. Except this word is, is, a, is a rare occurrence of a word. It only occurs three times in the New Testament, and only once by Luke. Luke wrote more New Testament than anyone else. You sum up Acts and Luke together, that's more than any other writer of the New Testament. He only uses this word once. You know what that word is? You know it. Exodus. It's the word exodus. It's very interesting. There's, he uses words for depart all over in his gospel, but he doesn't use that word here. He uses the word exodus, and it's for a reason. We're to see Jesus' move towards Jerusalem, to the fulfillment of what he must do there as a, a type of exodus. And so I want to I want to talk about that and begin to, to develop this thought here. This is just really, really intriguing to me. Because, you know, when you think of the word exodus, what, what name comes to mind? It's Moses, isn't it? Now this is really interesting. So Jesus is on the Mount Transfiguration talking about the Exodus with Moses. Mr. Exodus. <laughs> Only, you want to, want to tell you something? Share something with you? Moses is not Mr. Exodus. He's just the foreshadow. He's just the foreshadow. You know, so why are they there? Why is... Moses and Elijah there. I, I shared the typology of that, but, but why are they the two that were chosen, you know, as, you know, it's just interesting. Why, why are they, and why are they talking about the Exodus? What are they, what are they discussing? In Exodus 33 and verse 11, it says, the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. In Numbers chapter 12 and verse 8, when, when his sister Miriam and his brother Aaron speak out against him about concerning his wife and criticize him, God confronts Aaron and, and Miriam, and he says this, when I speak with him, with Moses, I speak mouth to mouth, clearly and not in riddles, and he beholds the form of Yahweh. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses, my friend? <laughs> so why are they there? They are not informing Jesus. 
They are not informing Jesus. Remember what Jesus told them in Luke chapter 9 and verse 22, just a few verses before. After Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of God. And then Jesus' response to that, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day rise. Jesus doesn't need informing about the what's coming in Jerusalem, right? <laughs> So why, do, why are they there and why are they talking about the exodus and what, the, what was to be fulfilled coming in? Because they're friends. They're friends. And God is giving them a preview of what is to come. What is about to occur? And it, it, it's just, that just, I don't know, that just, as someone who has all my life longed to be his friend, that just, that just moves me that he is giving them He's speaking. He's informing them about what is to come. And I, and I, I don't know exactly how that, that conversation would have played out. But I, I can imagine some of it. And Jesus addressing Moses. Do you remember that Passover in Egypt? Do you, do you remember that? Do you know what, what that was all about? <laughs> can, can I tell? Can I share? You were being obedient. You were doing what you were asked. But do you know why? Let me, let me tell you about that as, as, your, as a friend, face to face. Why did you sacrifice that lamb? Let me tell you about that. Moses, why was it that it was the firstborn that night that was slain? Why the firstborn? Let me explain why that had to be. Moses, again, Jesus addressing Moses. Do you remember what I asked you to speak to Pharaoh? Do you remember what that was? Yes, Lord. The Lord has requested, Yahweh has requested us to go a three-day journey into the wilderness. And I can imagine Jesus, why did I ask you to do that? Why was that what you were asked? <laughs> well, let me share, give, give you insight. You, you, you had no understanding, you were just being obedient. But you had no idea that you were foreshadowing Messiah. Elijah. Why was it that I asked you to go three days' journey across the Jordan into the wilderness? Read, I encourage you, Second Kings chapter two. From the time it's three days' journey out beyond the Jordan, and then he's caught up. What, what was what was that all about? Why the three-day journey? What, what was what was that all about? Moses, why did I ask you to lay hands? on that second goat, the, the scapegoat on the Day of Atonement. Why did I ask you to send that goat out into the wilderness to, to some demon god called Azazel? He's a demon god represented by a goat. Why did I send you out into the wilderness? Why did we send that goat out into the wilderness? I can just look at Moses and I have not a clue. <laughs> I, I, I don't have a Well, let me tell you why. <laughs> and and, and wouldn't you have just loved to have been there? I, I got it. There would, I would love to be just a fly on the wall just listening to that conversation. Maybe someday we'll, you know, I'll, well, I'll have the opportunity to ask Moses and Elijah about that conversation. Well, today I want to look at this three-day journey. And I, I just want to get into this just a little bit. But in the next few weeks, I want to go on this journey with the Lord, this journey to Jerusalem, to what he must fulfill in Jerusalem to accomplish. And I think we have to view the cross in some ways as a, in, in terms of an exodus. So I want to share some thoughts on that. So in Exodus chapter 3, and verse 18, and I referred to this just a bit ago, but in Exodus 3 and verse 18, God encounters Moses at the burning bush. And he to, responds to Moses' question, remember, who shall I say sent me? God says, tell him I am has sent you. Yahweh, tell him Yahweh has sent you. Now, two verses, three verses later, and God tells Moses, and they will listen to your voice, and you and the elders of Israel shall go to the king of Egypt and say to him, Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. And now, please let us go up. 
three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. Now I want you to note that, um, that so they're asked to go before Pharaoh and they're to tell them that they must go at God's command, a three days journey into the wilderness with the goal of sacrificing. It's going to be a sacrifice to Yahweh our God that we may sacrifice. Well, it's interesting because in Exodus chapter 5 and then in Exodus again in Exodus chapter 7, Moses confronts Pharaoh and each time he makes the request that we would go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may worship our God. So in Exodus chapter 5 and verse 1, it says, Afterward, Moses and Aaron went and said to Pharaoh, Thus says Yahweh, the God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. That word feast, again, is, is, is interesting. I'm doing some research on it. And it's a word that, again, we're, we're familiar with. It's Hajj. Arabic and Hebrew are related languages. And every year, you remember, if you know anything about Islam, is that they go on a hajj to Mecca, a pilgrimage. It's this, well, the Jews weren't making a pilgrimage to, to Mecca or any other, but they, they were on a pilgrimage. They're commissioned by God to, to go on a, the, the word could be translated a couple different ways, but it's a procession. And it's, 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 a, it's a procession walking. It's a, it's a holy pilgrimage to God. So they're, it's interesting. Continuing in verse 2, But Pharaoh said, Who is Yahweh that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I don't know Yahweh, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. Then they said, The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to Yahweh our God, lest he fall on us with pestilence and with sword. The requested to go that three days journey. You know, this question has always kind of um, been there for me, but why did they never go a three days journey into the wilderness? And why did they never sacrifice? My my understanding was that they always left Egypt and they went to Sinai. And, and, and I'm just always kind of like, what was, this, what was this thing about from the very beginning, from the burning bush? Go three days out into the wilderness and offer a sacrifice. And I was wrestling with that again this week. And it's really interesting because it pivots on this question is when does the three-day journey begin? Does it begin when they leave Goshen, when they pack up and they begin their travels? Or does it begin when they leave Egypt? Now the Red Sea has always, always, always been the, the eastern border of the Red Sea um, of Egypt. And so it's interesting because to turn to Exodus chapter 15, verse 22, because there is a three days. There is a three days journey. Just, I mean, God wasn't just saying that again and again. For, for he, was, he was speaking for a reason. It says, verse 22 of chapter 15, Then Moses made Israel set out from the Red Sea, and they went into the wilderness. Remember? A three days into the wilderness. Now that's, and, and it says, They went three days in the wilderness and found no water. When they came to Marah, they came to a place called Marah. Do you remember what Marah is? Do you remember the story of Ruth? And, and how Naomi, when she came back, she's lost her husband, she's lost her two sons, and she says, from now on, I'm no longer to be called Naomi. Call me Mara. I'm to be called Mara. Uh, it's bitterness. It's this, it's this bitterness of soul is, is the, the concept of this word. But this place is called Mara because the water there, when they came to Mara, they could not drink the water of Mara because it was bitter. Therefore, it was named Mara. And the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried to the Lord. He's crying out to the Lord. Um, 
what am I to do, Lord? What am I to do? And the Lord, it says this. Look at this. And Yahweh showed him a log. <laughs> Yahweh showed him a log. And he threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. Interesting. <laughs> really interesting. But, but there, there's, a, there's something that I don't understand. There's no mention of a sacrifice that morning. There's no mention of that. That was always the point. We're going out to worship, and we're going to sacrifice to Yahweh our God. But there's no lamb. And it's almost like I enter into the question of Abraham, Isaac, actually. Father, where's the lamb? Where's the lamb? Where's the sacrifice? Remember, please, let us go with about three days' journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to Yahweh our God. That's, that's the request. Look at verse 25. I'm going to read from the King James here because the translation is, is a little bit a little bit better. I think. It says, So he cried out to Yahweh, Moses, and Yahweh showed him a tree. It's a tree. And it, it, it's the word for tree. Um, so he shows them this tree, and, and, and Moses takes this tree and he casts it into the water, and the water remains sweet. That, that same word is the same word that's used in Deuteronomy chapter 21, where the law declares that cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Christ. The cross. There, there's a picture of, of the cross. They, they, they go three days into the wilderness, and there they find only bitterness and death. Only bitterness and death await. You know, on the third day before Christ rose, the disciples only found bitterness. And all they could see was death. But something happened. Because God says, look at the tree. And I want you to throw that tree into your bitterness, into that waters of death, and it becomes alive. Sweet. That's what Jesus has done for each and every one of us here today. I, I glory in that. I, I don't know. I get, it, I get really, really excited about that. That God chooses to reveal to his people for the very first time that there is coming a, a tree that is going to make their waters of bitterness sweet. That's what the Exodus. It's about. It's about our leaving Egypt, our being set free from a bondage to slavery, to sin, to death, and there we see Christ. We see the cross and we become released, free, and it changes our bitterness to something that is sweet, to something that is beautiful. I don't know if any of us here have something that is just really, really bitter. Just something that's just really hard. Really, really hard. I want to declare to you that God wants to change your bitterness into something sweet. He's been doing this in people's lives for 2,000 years. And I just want to tell you that it's as true today as it was 2,000 years ago when Jesus rose from the dead. There's something else that just excites me, so I, I've got to, I've got to share this as well too. But God reveals something else about Himself and His nature here for the very first time, and it's the next verse, verse 26. And God says this: If you will diligently listen to the voice of Yahweh your God, and do what is right in His eyes, and give ear to His commandments, and to keep all of His statutes. I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians, for I am Yahweh, your healer. I am Yahweh, your Rapha, your healer. You know, for the very first time in history, God identifies himself specifically by the name Yahweh Rapha. 
and it occurs at the place, the same place as the, where he reveals the cross for the very first time. And it's at that place of Kalmara where the waters became sweet. And I'm telling you, there is healing in the atonement. Yes, there is forgiveness of sins. Yes, there is, <laughs> yes, there, but there is also healing there. And I don't want us to overlook that. In, in Isaiah 53, God declares, but he was pierced for our transgressions. There is, in the atonement, there is, there is healing. There's redemption from, a, from transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that has bought us peace. And by his stripes, we are healed. Wow. But the atonement includes all these things. It deals with our transgressions. It deals with our iniquities. It deals with our total inability to live with peace in our life. And God brings healing in ways unimaginable. Healing in every dimension of, of our lives, not just physical, every dimension. So as we close, I'm wanting us to go on this journey with Christ. I've, we've looked today at this three-day journey, a three-day's journey with the Lord. But I want us to go with Christ and the disciples as they make their way to Jerusalem. I'm going to do this for the next couple of weeks. But I want to return to where we began in Luke chapter 9 and verse 30 and 31. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his exodus, which he was about to fulfill, accomplish in Jerusalem. It's my conviction that we must view the cross as God's great exodus. This is the fulfillment of exodus that we read about in Exodus chapter 12. This, this is the fulfillment of that. The exodus, the cross, it's not just something that Jesus accomplished for us, but it is also something that Jesus accomplishes with us. It is a procession. It is a journey. It is a walk of faith. And each and every one of us are called to walk with Christ out of Egypt. And as we walk with him out of Egypt, we find freedom, we find redemption, we find hope, we find peace, and above all, we find life. We find life. He makes our bitter waters sweet. We find life, and that life is found by the one who hung upon the tree. Amen? And man, that's him. He's the one that we look to. He is the one we worship. He is the one we praise. Amen. Jesus, I just glorify you. And I honor you. I thank you for that sacrifice. Oh, what a revelation that you shared with Moses and Elijah. Oh, what revelation you're still sharing with our hearts today. I pray, Lord, that we would be moved and quickened to our very core, our very soul. Lord, that it would stir our hearts so much to want to walk with you, to know you, to be your friend. But Lord, to enter into this sweetness of life that was purchased by your death on the cross. And I thank you for that. I thank you for the revelation of that. I thank you for the gift. Lord, may we never be the same. Having encountered you, may we never be the same. For all eternity, praising and glorifying you. And I pray that we would not be silent. I pray that we would not be quiet concerning the things, the good things, the, the wonderful things, the, the unimaginable glorious things that you have done on our behalf. And for all eternity, we praise you and glorify you. Amen.